Look at one card, but not this one. So now let's try something a little bit different. A lot of people ask me if I do uh, magic with my beard, and I actually do. But one of these long, scraggly beard hairs, and just, I don't know. I need a real beard trim, to be honest, like pulling out hairs like this. Let's see if we can use it for a magic trick here already. Was that your card? Yo, what's up? What's up guys and welcome back. Uh, today, we're talking about one of the most common plots in card magic, the ambitious card. Four of heart into the deck, and you just do hop. It goes through the other cards to the top. It is on top now. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I went too fast. I've not made a video about the ambitious card before, so I thought I'd uh, give you my thoughts, I'd give you some handlings, and as well some tips and some theory on what is probably the most common card trick in the world. Magicians have been performing the ambitious card for years, uh, from beginner magicians to master card handlers. The ambitious card routine, otherwise known as ACR, is probably the most overused, also one of the simplest and strongest impromptu playing card miracles. Now there's been some heated debate on the ambitious card routine. How many times does the card have to jump to the top? How many is too many? Three, four, eight, ten? Do you close the ambitious card routine with something stronger? Do you move on to something different which is stronger? Do you do it with a signed card? Do you do it with a card that you force? These are all great questions and we'll get into that. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the earliest publication for the ambitious card as we know it is by Jean Hugard. I believe it was in around the 1930s, but there probably have been other routines using this plot, just not using the name, the ambitious card. I believe a short card was actually used in the ambitious card to fool Houdini back in the day. I'm not going to get into every single publication of the ambitious card or we'd be here literally for about 10 hours. Every magician on the face of the planet has their own style of ambitious card. I've seen some that are terribly cringe and I've seen others that are incredibly presented and very fooling. Before we get into handling and uh, some of the things that I use in my ambitious card and when and why I use it, I'm going to talk about structuring. So if you're just getting into magic or if you're an intermediate or even a professional magician, you're always looking to improve your card magic in the strength of your magic to your audience. One of the ways to do that is to look how you structure an effect. Card jumping to the top is kind of an effect, but if you want to create a sort of memorable piece for the audience, you might want to have a few phases. Now, naturally, normally, I think just about three phases is just about enough. And don't get me wrong, if you're going into five or six or seven phases, that's fine too, as long as the performance supports what you're doing. So maybe it's a joke where the card just keeps coming back to the top and doesn't stop, you know, and people are laughing. But I, I think you can only beat a dead horse for so long before he stops coughing on money, right? That's a weird analogy, by the way. Who, who's ever beaten a dead horse for money? Huh. Moving on. Now, if we look at structuring, we look at trick one, two, and three. Naturally, we'd also want third piece of the ambitious card to be the climax, to be maybe the most visual or maybe the most memorable. Personally, I always like to have a playing card signed when doing ambitious card. Now, I know it's a magician thing where we're kind of overproving, saying, oh, this is the only card, but it does, for some people, remove the doubt in their mind that you may have uh, multiple cards of the same face. By having them sign it, obviously you can tell that to them. You can say, look, this is the only card like this in the entire world, unless you're the type of person that goes around signing cards for fun. Just me. All right. Once the card is signed, you want to set the tone for the effect. So perhaps instead of just putting it to the middle and making it jump to the top, maybe give a reason for that. Maybe, but since you've signed it, you've now put your name on it, you and the card share a little bit of a connection. I know it sounds weird, but it's not its not going to appear on my command anymore. It's going to appear on your command. Placing the card in the middle of the deck, snap my finger, the card doesn't rise to the top. Oh, right. You snap your fingers. Boom. There it is. That's a great way to start it. I think personally, that's something that uh, it takes the skill off me and places the magic onto them. 
them and gives them a little bit of an experience. So I, I like that angle a lot with Ambitious Card. Perhaps the cards are doing it themselves or perhaps you are the one controlling it. That is entirely up to you and how you want to structure that. And we'll get into the moves and some slights and stuff a little bit later. I just kind of want to run through structuring a little bit more. Phase two. Phase two, you don't want to do the same thing. And I've seen so many magicians do the same exact thing with the Ambitious Card. Literally, they do the exact same thing, which could be fine. Just don't, don't, don't over milk it. Because I think if you're doing the same thing over again, it's not a phase two, you're still on phase one. And then moving on to phase two and three, they might start to linger off and start to get bored. So for phase two, now at this point, I like to do something a little bit visual. I usually do one of two things, either a color change, Or something I like to say is, okay, well, I've done sleight of hand, you've done sleight of hand, whether you know it or not. Maybe this time we eliminate sleight of hand entirely and we see the exact moment that the card jumps up to the top of the deck. How cool would that be? Another great phase would be where the card appears in your mouth. Now, phase number three. I know by saying that we're doing the ambitious card, the card must jump to the top of the deck, but I always think ambitious card isn't strong enough to end on. I don't think it's something you want to be like, boom, and there it is again for the fourth time, for the 19th time it's on the top. Like there's no more surprise. They know what to expect, so you gotta hit them with a right. Basically, you just wanna come out of left field with this one and uh, make sure they don't see it coming at all. So they might expect the card to come to the top of the deck, but you wanna completely blow their minds. One of the best ways, I think, to do that is to either segue into something stronger or to prepare something before you even start. Kennedy Box is one of the best ways to do that. Now, there are a lot of variations on the Kennedy Box that you also have the, uh, was it the Altoids Box that my buddy Danny Garcia put out. Uh, you have that clear one, which is really cool. Basically, uh, you put this in plain sight since the beginning this box is here the entire time and at the end you open the box and show a folded card which happens to be their signed playing card which is there the whole time so that is something i would love to end on or perhaps you want to end on a card under their watch where it's folded up beneath their watch which is also pretty cool before we get into a few slides i also want to say that uh ambitious card for me has always been a little bit jazz now i do have a few routines that i use and some pattern that i go over but i'm always willing to change that up depending on the situation if i see something uh, that might make the magic stronger. I might capitalize on that and use my cards and use my knowledge of magic to my advantage uh, to you know, astonish the spectator even more, make things a little bit more impossible. So I'm always on the lookout for that. So I've been performing you know, card magic for a long time, so I'm comfortable enough knowing in my repertoire that I don't always have to follow you know, A, B, and C. I can go from A to C to E and then back to B and then hit them with a Z. Is it Z? We say Z. Those are all things that are very possible once you have more knowledge in magic. So be on the lookout for that. I, I always like to use Ambitious Card as a sort of jazz magic uh, to start a conversation with somebody and to get to know the spectator a little bit more before I show them something a lot stronger. But again, that's completely up to you. Now let's move into a few slights and a few tricks that I use in my Ambitious Card that you guys might be able to use as well. So to start, an ambitious card routine, I think one of the best places to start is literally to have them choose any card. Now, quick tip, a lot of people do this, take any card, it doesn't matter. I hate that line, I think it's condescending, and I think if you're involving someone else, it should matter what card they take. So instead, if you can have them choose any card, and if your deck allows it, and you're not holding anything fishy in here, give them the deck and say, I want you to go through there, and I want you to take a card that means something to you. Make sure you take the right card, because it does matter. Maybe even direct them to say, hey, take a card that has some some space on it that you can write something on. You know, maybe not one of these cards, but something that has a little bit of space on it. So once they've done that, let's say they take their card, instead of having them write their name on it, and a lot of people do that as well, and I've mentioned that, you can have them write their name, which is super cool, which allows them to know that that's their card. Maybe have them write something special on it. Maybe a word that means something to them. What's really interesting about that is that sometimes, every now and then, you're gonna be able to read off them what that word could possibly be. Maybe it's a pet. And I say, oh, paws. Interesting. That's uh, your dog? What kind of dog do you have? And at this point, you can do get readies. Uh, you have something to talk about other than saying, uh, okay, why did you choose this card? Is this the, uh, the, nah. you know what I mean? Just like talk about what they wrote down. I think it's a great, great little way to keep the ball rolling and, you know, stop being awkward. Now I'm going to show you a few things. I'm going to show you how sleight of hand works when I do it, but then I'm going to let you do some sleight of hand. And then I'm going to eliminate all the sleight of hand entirely. I want you to see your card right here. Ball. 
all the way back on top. Now you might be you might be thinking to yourself, well, this guy is really slick and he's using this crazy sleight of hand and you might be right. So instead, now I'm gonna have you take the cards in your hand, hold your hand flat, perfect. I want you just to hold this top card. Now they're gonna hold this. While they hold that, I'm gonna lift this up and I'm gonna ask them to put that back there. And they're gonna put it back. I'm gonna lay that on top. I want you to turn over the top card. Now they've turned it over and it's their card. That's a great way to do that phase. Another way to do that, as long as it's in their hand, I think that's a really good uh, step up from me doing it in my hands. Now they're going to do it in their hands. So in the first phase, uh, the only thing I've done was a control that I came up with, which is this one here. Uh, you can check it out uh, in my car controls. I think it's like my favorite car control. I named it something like that, but whatever car control you want to do, uh, you can even just, you know, have it in the middle and then do like a double undercut, which is when you hold a break, you grab half and then the other half, and then it's back on top. Whatever you want to do to make a jump to the top, let's say a pass, all right? So it's here. You can say, okay, your card's in the middle, as you can see, and now it's back on top. So whatever, whatever slight you want to use, is fine as long as the card goes back to the top. Now for phase two, a lot of different things you can do. Uh, a lot of people like to do the uh, the Marlowe tilt, which looks something like this. I'm gonna take your card and place it somewhere in the middle, maybe right about here. And if I snap my fingers, the card jumps to the top. I can put it right back in and it jumps to the top once again. And what the Marlowe tilt is, and I'll show you this right here, this is a really clever and simple move that anybody can get the hang of. You want to basically lift up one card, okay? With your index finger, you're lifting up one card and you're holding it by the rest of these fingers. So from the front, you can't really see that there's a big gap, right? Because you're kind of holding it like this, which is really, really great. You're just going to push a bunch of these middle cards randomly so that they protrude a little bit at the front. So it looks like you're putting it in the middle. And then finally, you're just gonna lay it on top of this packet to make it the second card from the top and hold it with your pinky and the meat of your, the base of your thumb right there. So it looks like it's going in and then just open your hand, it's in the middle of the deck. Now, it's actually second from the top. So once it's second from the top, what you wanna do is just a double lift, show them that card that it jumped to the top. Now at this point, what's really cool is that you can place this in their hands. You know, you can have them push it in all they want and it still jumps to the top. What I like to do, like I said, I like to I like to use a bit of cardistry in performance and I don't even care what you think about that, but what I, what I do is I say, yeah, okay, I might, I might be doing some sleight of hand, but this time you're gonna do uh, the sleight of hand. I want you to take that card and put it to the middle, put it in the middle, whoops, and it's still on top. And so what I've done there is a thing called the simpler switch. And I've gotten so used to doing this, I've been doing this for years, that I do not even look at my hands when I'm doing this. In fact, if I look at my hands, it'll look worse than if I don't. That's how used to doing this trick I am. So I, I do this kind of little flourish with my cards. And then once I get here, I take this card and I sort of pop this down with my fingers just enough for this card to get behind. I'm here, I say, oh yeah, you might think I'm using, and at this point I'm looking at them in the eye because I want them to look at me. You might think I'm using sleight of hand and you might be right, and I'm already set up, and I do this all the time. This is like my go-to get ready for a double lift. So it's just something casual I do. Um, it looks flourishy because I'm explaining that I'm using sleight of hand, and then once I'm here, I just pop it behind that card now, it's second from the top. That's something I like to use. Feel free to practice that. You can just sit at home and do this. You're just holding the card here and you're flicking it there, right? I think that's from Paul Harris. Uh, he does the simple switch where he takes both of these and switches them like this. Not something I'm very proficient at, but I do have this one down. So instead of just dropping it here, and you can do that too. You can even you know, show them that you're just throwing it to the top of the deck and when you're ready, throw it second to top. Another good idea is to uh, is to have a top change. So if you're here, you're gonna say, okay, you're gonna take the card and place it in the middle. Boom, now it's here. And all I've done there was as I'm talking and I, I've top changed and I've pointed to that. So again, any means to bring that into their hands is a good reason. For phase three, I'm not gonna get into too much with phase three, just because I want you guys to be creative. Now there are a ton of magic stores out there, a ton of shops. Uh, just play around with what works for you for the third phase, because I think that's the most important one, whether you want it to appear in your wallet or whether you want it to appear in your pocket. You know, putting it in your pocket's actually not a bad idea. They can. You know, that's pretty cool too. And then you can, from there, 
uh, you can do the whole card to pocket thing where you're like, all right, it's already, it's already in my pocket. As you can see here, boom, and cards here. You know, whatever you wanna do at that point, it's cool. I really think the Kennedy box is a great way to finish this. Any type of card to impossible location is absolutely great because they've signed that card and for them to find it anywhere else other than in the deck is absolutely magical. So play around with that. Um, I might leave some links below to a few of the things that I've mentioned that you guys can check out. Hope you enjoy my thoughts and theory and techniques on techniques, techniques. <laughs> I hope you enjoy my thoughts, theories, and techniques uh, that I've talked about and used here in this video today about the ambitious card routine. Uh, let me know below how many phases and what phases you like to do and what you like to end with and start with. I'm really interested to see, and I'm sure a lot of other magicians watching this would love to read through your comments, so go ahead and comment below. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope to see you on the next video, and until then, peace.